Having Billings on the side of the aircraft becomes almost more personal for people in Billings. And so people are really proud of it. Like it's a big point of pride in the community. Well, we started in the mid nineties, um, family run business. It was started by my father, Al, and my uncle Gary. A Little bit later, they got the idea to start spraying with a surplus UH-1 E-model Huey. Quickly realized spraying wasn't really the mechanism and uh, by about 1997, they had figured out that they had a little bit of a niche in firefighting and the rest is history, so to say. The philosophy is buy an aircraft that has some level of issues, whether that's mechanical issues or certification issues or whatever kind of issue it is. Fix it up, operate it, and then at some point somebody comes along and wants it more than you do, and then you kind of look for the next platform. When the Chinooks took off, that was a real change and we had to ramp up in terms of resources and people pretty significantly. There's no bank that'll finance you. It's like you have to move forward. Uh, we were currently operating about three S61s. We happen to be partnered with another company. They took one of the S61s, they bought that. We had one over in Afghanistan. It had gotten blown up. It was on a lease. And so that was cashed out as an insurance check. And so we had one S61 left. And then coincidentally at that time, that was right when my brother AJ passed away. So that was July of 2013. So nobody was really talking about expansion or thinking about that. It was, everybody was more frankly in the grieving process. And as with any good helicopter or fixed wing operator, we always are looking at what's coming up on the auction block. And so when we saw them and really specifically Gary and Al, you know, everybody's evaluating the aircraft and went, holy smokes, this is a really phenomenal platform from a performance perspective. We got to take a run at it. And so, we actually flew down to Alabama where the first two were on the auction block. And I think that the family kind of needed a, a bit of a next thing, you know, after losing AJ. And so maybe not the perfect way to deal with grief, but you know, it made sense and it was exciting and it was something to look forward to. And also when we jumped off the cliff and we bought the aircraft, there was no choice. There's no going back. You know, we couldn't even pick them up, right? We didn't have people to fly them and so we're having to hire people to fly them or figure out how to fly them ourselves. Ferry permits were difficult. And that's before we even get into them. So everybody really went on a mission and, and started pinning down any piece of tooling, any spare parts they could get, any kind of data that we could get our hands on, um, you know, tech, technical data agreements. We really went after it very aggressively. The type certification was hard. The pilot, you know, type rating issues were extremely difficult. Um, so it was a really pretty intense and frankly kind of scary. This is my 19th year in fire. I had uh, watched Billings come out into the fire game with the Chinook. They'd been in the game already, the business. So I kind of just, you know, sat back and watched. And the amount of water that was coming out of the thing was just mind boggling. And it's a pretty cool helicopter. It's different, you know, it doesn't have a tail rotor, obviously. We have a tank chip and we have bucket chips and the workload's distinctly different for the co-pilot. So the bucket ship, the command pilot, or the pilot in command has a lot more work. Co-pilot's more like monitoring the systems of the aircraft, and the command pilot's flying the bucket. So now you take the tank ship, the command pilot's flying the helicopter and the snorkel into the water, but the co-pilot's running the snorkel system, the pump, they're monitoring the flow rate, the pressure of the system, and checking for malfunctions. They're watching command pilots drift, and they're also monitoring the systems. So their workload is exponentially harder. I don't look at it as dangerous, I would say complex. And so, like anything that's complex, the way you mitigate is with training. We do a lot of this rules of the road thing, we try to pass each other like we would in America, my friend, on the left door to left door, and we say things like that. We talk about, we say when we're coming out of the dip and when we turned off the drop, because you as the uh, incoming aircraft can picture what that other person is going to do. And the same with the dip site. If you're coming into the dip site and it's blind, you hear that the other aircraft is coming out of the dip. You recognize, okay, I should expect this thing to pop up in front of me shortly and I can maneuver away from that. But if you start mixing dissimilar platforms, you have this big speed difference. So you can easily become traffic jammed. And then when you're in a heavy helicopter that drops a lot of water, you've got that added thing of if I drop in the wrong spot, people could be there that I don't see and you could literally fatally injure them. So and there's other things you can knock trees down and cause other, you know, 
people to be injured that aren't, weren't even engaged in this. I mean, besides the ability to lift a lot of water, you know, or retardant, whatever, there it has a lot of speed. It, it's it's a fast moving helicopter. And then in the tank application, our tank is unique with its fill rate. So it makes for a short time in the dip site. So you spend more time dropping water on the fire. I've heard many times from helicopter managers, and they figure it out, cost per gallon. And they say the Chinook is the cheapest delivery platform out of everything. You know, not, not a shot on other helicopters. It's just, it, Billings did a really amazing job developing this tank. And then the bucket has an advantage because it can get into tighter dip sites and it'll pick up more water. We don't have the weight of the tank. Montana deserves all the credit in the world, from the DNRC to the state legislature to the governor. They've done a phenomenal job of being kind of on the cutting edge of it. They've taken um, the funding for firefighting. They've carved out a portion of the general fund. They've pushed it a little earlier of what gets funded, and so it's a priority. And it's allowed them to have a lot better resources and be better prepared for you know, hotter, in more intense fire seasons. So it's really cool what they're doing and we get to partner with them. We're the lucky ones that have won these first couple type one helicopter contracts and it's been great. We're Montanans originally, they're Montanans. It's like a really natural culture fit. So our people love it, the DNRC loves it. It's been a great relationship. It's been a massive success. And so they've loved the Chinook especially, they've loved the team, but it's really the right platform for the area, right? It's Montana's big. And so sometimes you're going on really long initial attack runs. And so having an aircraft that can carry 2,500 gallons and do very long initial attacks with, you know, high ground speed is really critical, especially on this eastern side of the state. The data is suggesting is that aggressive initial attack is not only better in terms of, you know, loss of property or damage to the, the force, but the other side of that is it's also much more cost effective. And so that's why you're seeing some of these states like Montana push towards aggressive initial attack. And so what we have seen as, as their partner is that that has allowed the firefighting cost to decrease, but it also, you know, in terms of property loss, we've also seen that dollar value decrease pretty significantly. So what they're paying for a Chinook is a very significant savings over you know, not having it and losing that property loss and then the increased firefighting costs if the fires get bigger. Aerospace is really struggling from a supply chain perspective. And so what we found out is that A, it's either impossible to get the part or B, it's so uneconomic for a private company to purchase that part that we can't get it. Um, so sometimes on parts we'll see 42 month lead time, sometimes even longer. And so we have to be totally self-sustainable. So we do everything in-house. We do our own transmissions. We do our own high-speed drive shaft, our own hydraulic actuators, our own electromechanical actuators, flight computers, you name it. We kind of do it in-house. And not only that, but we use all the available tools that the FAA gives us to keep the aircraft flying. STC, PMA, owner produced parts, 145 repair specifications. We use any resource we can get. So that's one thing we've really done well is we're not looking to run the Chinook for the next couple of years. We're looking to run it for the next 20. And how you do that is a very robust supply chain. And we feel like we found a really unique solution to that problem. And that's been one of the real fun parts of the business.